Welcome, 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 KHCS 1220 and 98.1 FM with my wonderful co-host, Alex Grossman, in the studio live! That announcer Alex. voice there, Mr. Brian Johnson, is a little crazy for me today. I, I think I should get a job as an announcer at a, a baseball stadium or something. Only if you don't want to make a lot of money. Well, that, that that's obviously true. Very true. So, um... For those of you who are just tuning in to the Ask Brian Show, and that's A-S-K-B-R-I-E-N, we are p- basically a business education show. Every week we have a conversation with a CEO or an entrepreneur or a startup person who has either a new product idea or just has a regular idea that they're working on that they've been successful at. And the Ask Brian Radio Show is part of the Ask Brian website. That's, again, A-S-K-B-R-I-E-N. En.com. And if you go to the website, the website has a business community where we'll have a whole bunch of dry cleaners talking to each other and saying, listen. Not I'm always dry cleaners. Well, it could be anything. <laughs> uh, and by the way, even among dry cleaners now, you've got organic dry cleaners, regular dry cleaners. They even are se- separating it out from that perspective. That's very true. And then uh, we also have the experts. And the experts are people, some of them have been on our show. Some of them are just qualified. They have to have 10,000 hours of work, which typically is 2,000 hours per year. If you take 50 hours a week at 40 hours, that's 2,000. So you need typically five years' experience working in one specific subject area. Could be website design, could be accounting, could be management, could be sales, could be um, corporation formation, could be anything. But you need to have at least five years' experience or or certain people, you know, people that are on Wikipedia, certain people that have uh, uh, spoken and, and have uh, written books, etc. There are other ways you can apply to become an expert. And every expert is allowed to post their webinars. So if you have somebody that's on the site, they're an expert, they've been qualified, you can go and get an expert how to set up my accounting records because I've never done that before. I'm in sales. I'm starting a new business or vice versa. I'm an accountant. I'm starting my new business. I don't know how to sell. Uh, how can I how can I get my first leads, my first customer? That's always a very difficult subject. And each expert posts in addition to webinars, they will post videos, ebooks, blog posts, it's basically trying to teach people any business subject. And that's what Ask Brian, A-S-K-B-R-I-E-N dot com is all about. We're a community where we try to help other people. Now, today we have a very special guest. Uh, he has a background over 25 years experience. Uh, he is an accountant, but he doesn't practice, but he's also a lawyer. He's worked for uh, companies uh, in the past, and uh, basically, he's me. Oh, he hosts a radio show, too, called Ask Brian. And he hosts a radio show and has a website, Ask Brian, A-S-K-B-R-I-E-N dot com. So, Alex, you had a couple questions. Yeah, I think that, you know, we've had over the last few months, and I, I think I mentioned this last week, we have a lot of people who have asked questions, specifically business questions, that really had to do with the law. And we thought since you're a practicing attorney, it might be a good time to turn it around a little bit and for me – to interview you and ask you some questions from people. Okay, so a caveat here, people. Uh, unfortunately, the way the ethical rules are written and attorney malpractice laws are written, I'm going to be providing information in a general character and in a general nature. It does not apply to a specific situation, and I will answer those questions as a lawyer, but this is not legal advice to be relied upon. I love I that. I had to do that caveat. I love that. <laughs> so let's start with a couple that we've gotten and, and some, of these, uh, some of these you may say apply, some of them don't apply, but I, I think just going looking at the questions that we've gotten in, I'm going to start with the first one. So the first one is, and, and I've been always worried about this as a small business owner myself, what is the risk of being sued as a small business owner, and what do I do if I'm sued? That's an excellent question. If I I'm a dry cleaner, I give people the wrong clothes, what do I do? Well, that's a, that's a little bit different issue here. Uh, you probably can resolve that by cu- good customer service. Uh, if you give them the wrong, first of all, you can have them when they come into your store. Uh, you can have them look at the items, make sure that those items, make sure the tickets match up. There's various things. I don't want to get into that discussion. I want to really quickly go over this discussion here. So anyone who's in business for a long enough time that's successful enough, I hate to tell you, but you're nearly guaranteed to be sued. Nobody is going to live a life uh, as a business owner that's successful, 
that's never going to be sued. For one thing, um, and now certainly it will matter the type of business you're in. Okay, certainly if you're driving a taxi cab, you know you could scratch your car, get in a car accident, and maybe your insurance company is going to represent you. So uh, there are various things. I think the biggest determination, though, is when you're dealing with a lawsuit. Is first, if you do get sued, you need to immediately contact a lawyer or an insurance company. And what, what I mean by that is the first thing I would do if I was sued is I would contact my insurance company to see if there's any insurance that I have that would protect myself. Because by protecting myself and having an insurance company uh, take it, there's a couple of things that happen. First of all, if they were legally required to represent you because you did have insurance coverage and they failed to do so, then they will be on the hook big time uh, for something called bad faith. So that's one reason why you want to identify the insurance. Two is you don't want to go out and find an attorney and start paying money to an attorney out of your own pocket if you don't need to. That's why you have insurance. Okay. The other issue that you need to contact an attorney for is you need to know really what's going on, what, what the possible bill risks are to you and to your business, uh, what's going to happen, and you know the viability of the claim, et cetera. You really need to get somebody – uh, to find it out. Now, lawsuits can come up in many sizes, many different areas. I mean, you could have an employee dispute, okay? And the employee disputes can be uh, involved just as simply as you fired an employee and they're fighting you on unemployment insurance all the way up to a wrongful termination case because they whistle blow on you because you were selling uh, nuclear missiles to Iran during Let's hope not. and sanctioned. You know, uh, you know, hopefully no, not. But there are all these type of things. Also, with insurance companies, the first thing that will happen is if you do have insurance coverage, the insurance company will have somebody, an adjuster, that you'll file a claim with, and they'll determine whether or not you're covered or not. So, for instance, you may have a general liability policy, and somebody may be suing you for sexual harassment. So whether or not you're going to be covered by that policy, that's the first thing they're going to make. Usually, many times, what an insurance company will do in those circumstances is they will take the case initially, uh, this is not a guaranteed rule, but they will initially take the case, represent you, contact the opposing counsel with a reservation of rights. Reservation of rights meaning that you may or may not be covered here, and if you're not covered, we're advising you that you're not covered. But in the meantime, we know that the risk of not responding to a lawsuit and obtaining a judgment and a default judgment is so high that we're going to take the risk out of the equation and go ahead. Is it a good idea, even if you're dealing with an insurance company, just to contact an attorney to see what your rights are, or should you 100% trust that insurance company? Well, first of all, um, as far as trust goes, you know, obviously the insurance company has a, if they're going to cover you, they have a reasonable basis to make sure that everything is done correctly. Then that's not always going to happen. I would probably, as a, if I was not an attorney, contact a lawyer, go over the facts, go over the situation, and ask that attorney for their opinion. But I would it would probably be in limited to an initial consultation. There are times when there could be a conflict with you and the insurance company, such as we just discussed. So if you have an employee that's suing you for sexual harassment, the insurance company then says, hey, listen, we're going to provide you with insurance coverage. We don't think you're covered because this was an intentional act. And, you know, having, you know, whatever it was, I'm not going to get into the details, but if it was an intentional act, et cetera, you're not going to be covered by our policy, but we're going to cover you anyway because we want to make sure that there's no harm here and we want to, and we may, we may withdraw our claim. We may tell you we're not going to be representing you anymore. We may not pay any damages on it. Okay. In those type of cases, then, then probably is more important in those circumstances to have an attorney uh, potentially involved at a very, very limited basis, or at least somebody can just call up on, once in a while to get some information because, A, the case is going to be proceeding. At some point, they may say, we're not going to represent you. Uh, the other time is, uh, let's say somebody sues you for $2 million and you have a million-dollar coverage. Okay, uh, There may be times where you may need to consult with the attorney because, hey, listen, they've made an offer for me uh, of the policy limit, and, you know, uh, should I take it or not, whatever, what happens if I don't? So there are circumstances, but I would say as a general rule, if you have an insurance company representing you, if you get in a car accident and the insurance company is going to represent you, go ahead and do that. Now, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, which we haven't dealt with, is maybe you're a business owner and you want to sue somebody else. That's a completely different animal. So yeah. how do we know, and this is this is my question, not one, one of theirs, but 
How do we know what type of attorney to get? I and a two two part question for you here. A little hard for you. I'm gonna really want to put you on a spot like a real guest. Ding 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 ding. Here we go. So how do we know what type of attorney to look for? So let's say I'm getting sued or I want to sue someone. You know, there's no more yellow pages anymore. So I get on the web and I search. What type of attorney do I search for? That's part one. And the second part of it is, as a small business owner, and I've been I've been in small businesses and I've been in venture venture backed businesses. As soon as we went venture backed, all of a sudden I had to have an attorney on retainer, which actually was really good because whenever I had a question, I just pick them up and bother them, right? But how big do you have to be before you you do that? And is that really expensive? I mean, I can tell you. Ours was expensive, but, you know. Well, okay, and I'm not sure if you're referring to when is the time to hire hire a full-time attorney to be part of your organization, if that's the question, or if you're asking – Well, more of someone on retainer so you can just get those questions when you're in a growth of your business and that. I think it's always important, okay, in business – to either know an attorney that you can speak to on a, on a basis where you can pick up the phone and speak to them. It's probably a good idea when you're starting out in your business, you have an accountant and you have an attorney. Those are two people that you probably should have, even if you're doing your own taxes and doing your own bookkeeping, even if you don't have any lawsuits and you want to go through one of these online and corporation services to start your business, it's always a good idea to have somebody that you can speak to. So I would probably try to see if you can find a uh, consultation with a with a business attorney, okay, and ask them some questions and then potentially say, listen, as I go along, issues are going to come up. Is it okay that, that I can do something? And usually the attorney will be more than happy to sign some type of an arrangement with you uh, so that they can be – the on-call attorney when you have a legal issue. Now, it also seems like 50% of the people, at least in this room, are attorneys. So it seems like they're easy to find, but I think how it's do you only find 33% them? because it's really there's a, crazy, an engineer it? here, so it's only one-third. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but it's, it seems like that Unless in society, he has a legal degree. Easy. Do you have a legal degree? Uh, no, not a legal degree. No. All right, so then it is two out of three. That's not terrible. Then. I'm working on it, though. But go right. ahead. Well, now I forgot the question because I was talking. <laughs> the question is pretty simple. <laughs> so I don't have the yellow pages anymore. How do I go find an attorney? Do I ask a friend? What do I do? Well, okay. And what kind of attorney do I look for? There's a lot of different ones, okay, right? Okay, but, but your first, your original question to me was, okay, you've got sued and you don't know who to, what, what attorney to contact. Right. That's a little different context because in, your se- in the second part of the question, if you're a business owner, you look for a business attorney. That's pretty okay. simple, right? So you type in business attorney, law, uh, wherever you're located. So business attorney. Uh, New Hall, California, and you look around and you, you try to interview some of those attorneys. In a lawsuit, it can be a little bit trickier. Now, first of all, the first thing you have to identify is what are they suing you for, okay? So you can typically, as an attorney, I can pretty much figure that out. Uh, you may or may not be able to. If they're suing you for sexual harassment, you could type in sexual harassment attorney New Hall, right? right. Uh, but if they're suing you for breach of fiduciary duty, Okay, you may go. What the, you know, what is that? You may not understand what that concept is. Okay, uh, 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 so the first thing I, you probably may want to do in that circumstance is you may want to, you could actually do one of two ways. You could look at on every lawsuit. There's going to be a list of claims or causes of action that they have against you, and you could probably, I probably would start with the first cause of action if I had no background in the law at all and didn't know an attorney to call. Okay, so my first approach, if I had no, if I had to do it a DIY, do it yourself, I would probably type in the first cause of action. So it says complaint for whatever it is, breach of fiduciary duty, declaratory relief, defamation, whatever those that cause of action is. I would probably type in that in quotes, and then I would type in attorney Newhall, and then try to go through that, and then contact somebody and say this is what happened. What can I do? Because you just brought up that old saying about a fool and an attorney, if you remember that one, right? <laughs> okay. Well, but I don't know any fools. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit because these other questions seem to be really Is that because you have ADD? Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of that, too. <laughs> no, I want to keep it on the same same page here. So it says, how worried should I be? I thought we I don't be? have yellow pages. Well, we don't have no so yellow pages. So how can pages. we on the same page? We got white pages. So oh. <laughs> So how and worried should as well. And that's true. And how, papers. How worried should we should I be uh, about corporate compliance and keeping good records? Um, and how do I make sure I have the proper business license and all the other components I need to keep my business safe? Okay. For one thing, I want to say is you, you have asked a lot of two and three part questions. Okay. 
And that's, that's cause fine. you're smart. That's fine. But there's two things with that. One is, uh, you have to break them up in pieces so that each question can be answered specifically to that specific question. Okay. And two, this sometimes the way they you came jump, into me. What sometimes can I tell you? you jump to the next question without having answered the other part of that <laughs> first question. So having said that, I'm going to address the first issue, which is compliance. Now, if you set up your business and you set up as a corporation or a limited liability company where you can be provided with what's called limited liability so that you're only liable to the assets or, or value that you have in your business and nothing beyond that, okay, if you're setting up your business for that, you must comply with certain legal obligations. Failure to comply with those legal obligations or compliance, as you, as you have called it, can result in personal liability to the individual owner. So let's go over a couple of examples. Yeah, and how do I know what those liabilities are? That's well, if scary. I were you, I would call the law office of Peter Bronstein at lacorporateattorney.com. That's smart. But having said that, and that, by the way, is my website address, lacorporateattorney.com, okay, first, one basis is if you fail to file your tax returns. If you fail to file your tax returns, you are not in compliance. I think even individuals would understand that because individuals that don't file their tax returns could end up in trouble with either the IRS, the Franchise Tax Board, or whatever tax bureau that you're dealing with. And those are just income taxes. The other area is payroll taxes. If you hire somebody, okay, there's two bases for hiring somebody. If you're hiring somebody, 99% of the time they should be an employee. If they're working with you and you are controlling what they do and how they do it, that's a given. They are an employee, okay? Many, many people nowadays with companies like Upwork, Elance, uh, all these companies out there, they're hiring all these people to do work for them, and it comes down whether or not they're an independent contract or not can become an issue down the road. Now, those services you're probably okay with, but right. many people may hire, you know what, I need somebody to make sales calls for me. Uh, I don't want them to come in the office because I don't want to pay for parking and I don't. it's too long of a commute. Uh, I, I'm in uh, I'm in Marina del Rey, and my, they live in uh, in in Ontario, and the chief, it's cheaper to hire somebody from Ontario, and I'm going to have them make sales calls for me, and if they get calls for me, I'll follow up on those leads. Okay, that's a good example. Well, again, you would want to make them an independent contractor most likely, uh, but to do that, you cannot control them in sense of tell them when to call, how to call, what they have to do. The more control you have over a person, the more likely they could be deemed an employee. Uh, employees, there's a whole bunch of compliance issues. Is there do. a number of hours that's applied to that as well? Because you just made some interesting things here. I assume if I ha – and I've had a lot of salespeople in my life. I do tell them how many calls they have to make, even as an independent contractor. I do tell them how ma you know, when they need to call and when they need to be available. And, uh, and I often tell them what they can and can't do. Is, is that all bad? Well, it's not all bad, but the point is that you get closer and closer to at some point in time where if they were to bring an action against you saying they were misclassified as an independent contractor and should have been treated as an employee, that you can have those type of claims. The claims can be heard by the Labor Board in the state of California. The California Labor Board can file a claim, or you can file a lawsuit against people for that by saying I was misclassified, and so therefore you didn't pay my t payroll taxes. Now you're responsible for paying all of my payroll taxes. So – that, that could be an issue. But I want to go back because I, I did divert a little bit. I want to go back over this compliance issue. Yes. So you've got taxes. You've got payroll tax issues. You've got the independent contractor versus employee, which we could do an entire show just on that one area. Okay. The other area that's very important is commingling. So what happens many times is, hey, I own this business. It's just me. I need to pay $5,000 in bills. So I just start taking my corporation business and, oh, I'm paying my home utility bill or my – car repair bill, and that's not from business, or some other personal stuff. That was when, a question that came up, actually. Well, when you start mixing those items together, you are commingling, you're move, m using your business and personal assets and uh, in the same manner, then you can become, that's not a compliance, because you can become personally liable by using that. So therefore, if somebody were to go and check your records and you were involved in a lawsuit, they could come after you potentially personally for your commingling of your assets. Let's dig a little deeper here because one of the qu one of the questions that came in was. Well, I wanted to finish that question because we're going to be taking a break soon. Okay. And then we'll. But go I want to come back to that because that's really important. You mentioned compliance and commingling, so I'm going to make a little note on commingling. Well, commingling is definitely an issue, but the other issue you you've got to be very very careful about is 
you can become personally liable if you do something that's on your own. So for oh, actually, excuse me. The point I want to bring out: if you have a corporation, you have to do minutes on a yearly basis. If you fail to do minutes on a yearly basis, uh, corporate minutes I'm referring to, having board meetings on a yearly basis. If you fail to do those type of things, you can become personally liable. The other issue that I just mentioned earlier was intentional acts. Okay, you can't say, "Hey, I'm going to form a corporation," and then punch somebody in the face and say, "Hey, I'm not liable." Okay, that's not that's not really a compliance issue. But but actually preparing your taxes commingling your assets and not preparing minutes for your corporation, that's a sure way to make yourself personally liable and you will not be in compliance. And I think we're going to be taking a break and we're going to come back with your commingling question. Beautiful. We'd like to thank our advertisers and readers for their loyal support since 1991. Linda and Mo Hafizi, owners of Our Valley's two leading magazines, Elite and the Magazine of Santa Clarita. The only magazine in Our Valley mailed to 80,000 homes and businesses every month with over 250 pages of community news and features. Discover how the Magazine of Santa Clarita can help your business. Call 294 294- 4444. Superior quality is second nature to us. Just ask our advertisers. Experience the spirit of giving and the thrill of savings at the outlets at Tahone, a holiday shopping destination unlike any other. Shop amazing deals during extended hours all month long to find the perfect gifts for everyone on your list. Save up to 65% on over 60 of the top brands in fashion, accessories, and home goods. Like Coach Factory Store, Jimbery Outlet, H&M, Pottery Barn Outlet, Nike Factory Store, Michael Kors, Express Factory Outlet, and more. Outlets at Tahone, your must-shop stop for the holidays. Located just 40 minutes north off I-5. For sales and events, join the VIP club online at TahoneOutlets.com or find us on Facebook. Give and get at the Outlets at Tahone, where every purchase of $50 or more gives you a chance to win a gift from your favorite brands like Journeys, Tommy Hilfiger, Michael Kors, Skechers, Columbia, Calvin Klein, American Eagle, Oshkosh Bagosh, Carters, and Polo. Visit TahoneOutlets.com for official rules. Bob, I don't believe you. You're jaded, Blanche. Read my lips, Bob. You've had a history of exaggeration. It's true. They're building Castaic High School. Castaic High, like in Castaic, California. That's right, Blanche. Prove it, Bob. Go to your computer, type in CastaicHighProject.com, and get free and frequent updates. What's that web address again? CastaicHighProject.com. With fervor, like you really mean it. CastaicHighProject.com. If you're in danger of losing your home to foreclosure, you need an expert. Hi, I'm Rich Sherman with Alta Realty. I've helped hundreds of Santa Clarita residents save their homes completely for free. I've got just over 20 years' experience and a loan modification success rate of over 80%. I can negotiate better terms with your bank, and I can save your home from foreclosure. And again, we do this completely for free. So if you're in any danger, please call me today at 661-714-1400. That number again is 661-714-1400. I'm Rich Sherman with Alta Realty, and I'll be happy to help you save your home for free. Frontier Toyota has teamed up with Santa Clarita Sheriffs for this year's holiday toy drive. Spread joy to a child bringing a new toy to Frontier Toyota on Valencia Boulevard and Creekside. Test drive Frontier Toyota's most enticing new models, including the exciting 2019 Camry. Frontier Toyota, no games, just great deals. Like the world's best-selling Tacoma truck or test drive the 2019 Corolla. The Santa Clarita Sheriff Toy Drive and Frontier Toyota. A tradition of giving back to Santa Clarita. KHTS. Now FM. 98.1 FM and AM 1220. Your hometown station. Don't give up your day job, please. Welcome back. KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM with my co-host Alex Grossman and our very, very, very special guest, Peter Bronstein. That's right. So when we left, we were talking about co-mingling, which is going to be my favorite topic now. So there were two things on co-mingling. You, you were talking about co-mingling. Do people understand what that word means? No, and you need to define it, but hold on. You were talking about taking money – from the company to pay personal bills. But one of the other questions that came in, because it, it pertains, says, can I use my own money, my assets, 
to fund business expenses like buying furniture or office equipment or use my car for deliveries. How about using personal credit cards? So that's both sides of that. Okay, but you have a five-part question you're making. and That's you have a one-part question. It is a five-part question because <laughs> each, each question has an answer within it. So let's start off with the first part. So first of all, before we get anywhere, boys and girls, we're going to learn what the word commingling means. Okay. Commingling means if you have a business account, a bi uh, checking account or business bank account, and then you have a personal account, okay, or any other account that's not that business account, and you mix the assets by using the business account to pay bills of the personal account or the trust or another company, you are commingling. You are using the other – you're paying bills or using the monies for another account that's not your own account. That's what the term is, commingling. That's something you're not supposed to do. Commingling causes a lot of problems and can make you personally liable. Uh, it could also be, depending on what we're talking about, it could be even be involved in a trust. Let's say you're a trustee of a trust and you're making transactions and you're using personal accounts and the trust accounts for something, you are commingling. You could then be breaching your fiduciary duty and be responsible for various other, other actions. Can you define fiduciary for a lot of people that don't understand that? Okay, fiduciary. It's a big word. Fiduciary, F-I-D-U-C-I-A-R-Y, okay? Fiduciary duty is a higher duty than a normal person has. So for certain people, a lawyer, okay, a trustee of a trust, a director of a corporation, all these people have higher duties than the others. And one of the grounds for why there's a higher duty is because of their sophistication and their ability. So for instance, a director of a corporation has access and information about the company that other people do not have, okay? A trustee of a trust is put in that position to manage assets for other people okay and so you don't want and you don't want when you're managing assets for other people they have to have a higher standard they have to make more conservative investments than the typical person would do because they have to protect the assets their goal is protection of the of the of the of the main asset base not to just okay i'm going to buy bitcoin and uh and and, and the ipo and the la latest cannabis venture that's a dollar ten a share and then buy ten million shares of that. That would not probably be a good thing for a fiduciary to do. Okay. So great. So lots of responsibility. So higher duty. Higher duty. Now let's go back to your question. Yes. The five part question. I only heard the first part about so what was the commingling issue? First part the commingling issue I love the commingling word. The commingling issue that you mentioned was can I commingle corporate funds or business funds to pay my own personal bills? The, an the answer, commingling to anything, the answer is no. But your second part of your question, I believe, dealt with, okay, you have your own – you're starting out a new business, and you don't have the funds because the company has not made a dollar yet or maybe yes. is not making any money, and you need to buy office furniture, and you need to do deliveries with your car. I believe right. that was the question. Right. Yeah, so I, we're I buy office. I might even be in business for a while, but I don't really have. I'm not making so you, any you're money. You're delivering your furniture uh, in your car. I might be doing that. That's too. quite a car you got. It might be good. It's got a very, very big car to fit a <laughs> fit a couch in or or a bed in there. It's been done. All right. So first of all, if you're starting out a business and it has no money, all right, the first thing you need to do is establish how you're going to get money into the company until you're break even or profitable. All right. Now, one of the ways you can do that is you can individually put money into the company whereby you would create a promissory note between you and the company. You have to document things. You have to create these type of documents because otherwise you will be back in the same boat that you're using your personal assets for your business and become personally liable. And what happens is you start doing it that way. Five years go by. You get sued for a million dollars. You have $900,000 in the company or $300,000 in the company. You don't have enough for the million. And you say, oh, who cares? Well, who cares is the lawyer that's coming after you that's going to sit there and say, check your records and find out that you were doing this and that you didn't have proper documentation. You didn't have the loan documents. And they're going to come after you personally. And so now your house in Rancho Palos Verdes is gone. So that that fall oh, that'd be bad. So that <laughs> falls under commingling as well. So it's kind of that reverse commingling, right? Right. But if you do it right, you can do it fine. How about this other question in here, part five, as you like to call it here? 
which is how about using personal credit cards? Now, I've seen that before where people, you know, they say start a business, they can't go get a business credit card because there's no money in the account, so they just use their personal credit card. Well, first of things. all, I don't, I don't agree with that anymore. In the old days, I do agree with that. First of all, forgetting about whether or not you, can, you have a good enough hit credit history to get a credit card, okay, and there are some corporate accounts where you can get them through American Express, et cetera, Okay. Nowadays, with the debit cards, you can anyone can form a corporation and get a debit credit card for their business, and you can actually use that. Okay. Now, in terms of so that would be the smarter thing to do. Well, that's one way, but that would be again being your your own personal money has to still get into the account, right. and you still have to do it the same way we just discussed. You need to create a loan document. Okay. If you document things, you're fine. When you don't document things, that's where trouble arises because you. You can't think about what happened, and you know, oh, I was just trying to do it one way or the other. So you create a promissory note, and it's also for tax purposes because down the line, you, your business makes $300,000, and you invested $200,000 in it by a promissory note, and you take the $200,000 out, and you're afraid that you're gonna, you know, when you put it in your bank account that Uncle Sam's going to say, well, you just made $200,000. No, I didn't. It was a loan. So, so let's touch on that a second. So th this goes back to your thing about keeping good records and understanding, you know, compliance. So if you do something like a promissory note, but you're putting money in every week, does this mean you have to write a promissory note every week? Or can you put this on a ledger? Well, the shorter answer is technically yes, but I would treat it more like a line of credit. So I would create a promissory note whereby certain amounts are transferred, and you, as long as you attach the transaction, the bank statement or something at the end of each month, you could do it that way. Obviously, you can't do every single transaction like that, but in, in, in theory, you know, in practicality, but in theory, you are doing it that way, and I, I would create that, that type of ledger that would be attached each month. And we all know it's not safe, nor is it probably legal to go retroactive to do these things, so you want to have an attorney set it up in the beginning and do it right. Well, here, the problem with retroactivity is somebody dies. I've seen that happen a lot. It happens. People form corporations. There were three shareholders. They didn't do anything. They didn't have minutes for 13 years. Wow. Then they get sued, okay, uh, five years after the person died. Well, how are you going to go back in, in time and recreate those board of directors meetings to make sure that you're not personally liable? So you really should be doing things on uh, as a go. Now, one question that you asked me earlier as part of your part four question, but I still haven't seen you ask me that question specifically, uh, although you did ask me when you asked the four-part question, what is it revolving around compliance issue regarding business licenses? I was getting there. That was my next last <laughs> one. It's right here. How do I make sure I have the proper business license or everything else I need to stay in business? Well, and be, everything and be else you need, we don't have a – this is not a seven-hour show. So <laughs> let's not well, do customers <laughs> and things like that, obviously. <laughs> so, and by the way, you're listening to KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Somebody has to do that. Very good. Now you're compliant. I, I'm compliant with uh, KHDS to a certain extent. Now, if you are in business and you're operating in a community, okay, you are supposed to get a license to operate that business in the community. There are some places where you may be operating out of your house, and there might be an issue whether or not that's a commercially zoned area that you can even operate out of your house. Those right. issues have come up in the past. Okay. Also, at some point in time, when that city you live in needs revenue, what do they do? They go down the street and they go, oh, I'm going down, as an example, Melrose Boulevard or Sunset Boulevard, and there's 20 businesses here, and I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, do you have your business license? And they don't, and I'm going to issue a fine and tell you you have to get it. Okay, So that's the other issue. And you need a business license because each city or community, so it can be a city or a county or a municipality, has to know who you are and that you're in business and what you're doing, and then also technically most of the time you have to pay a fee with that, and that's their revenue. And so they will come after you in some manner, just like the IRS would, uh, to try to collect money to raise funds for the municipality so they can buy the big Christmas tree that they want. Absolutely. So I'm going to add one to that. So what, what is a DBA? I, we hear about that all the time, fictitious business. You have to have that before you start a business. Well, okay. Uh, okay. DBA stands for doing business as. Okay, and so basically, if you open up, if you want to open up a business, okay, and your name is Alex Grossman, and you want to open up a, uh, what kind of business do you want to operate? I want to open up a laundromat. All right, so, uh, and it's going to be called O's Laundromat. There we go. Okay, well, is your name O's Laundromat? Absolutely not. Right, so you can't, you could call it Alex Grossman's, okay, 
and that you could do, okay, because that's your name. But if there's a, n a name there and it's O's laundromat, people need to know who that is. Well, how are they going to do that? S because maybe there's a problem. Maybe O's laundromat doesn't uh, dry my clothes, and I'm pissed. Oh, excuse me. I shouldn't use that word. I apologize. And I'm upset. Okay, I have to go ahead and do something about that. I want to find out who the owner is. Okay, right. So anyone that is operating business that's not in their own personal name, okay, they can form a corporation, they can form an LLC, they can form a partnership, they can do that through the state. Partnerships could actually technically be done without without the state. But if you're going to operate a business that's not in your own name, you have to get a fictitious business name. In order to do that, that it's a two part process. So first of all. In the county of Los Angeles, you would have to go to the county recorder's office and determine whether or not there's any O's laundromat. Because you can't have five O's laundromats. Okay? You'd need some other letters. You'd have to pick some other letters at that point, yeah. Right. You'd have to be OHS okay. as opposed to just O apostrophe S. Right. Okay? Like the uh, baseball player, uh, Sarah O, who had 715 home runs, who actually, Hank Aaron actually, uh, record was broken by. Anyway, getting back to a more. That was great trivia. Thank you. <laughs> I am a great trivia person. Uh, but regarding the DBA, you would then first go to the county recorder, make sure that the name is uh, available. Then, once you do that, then it has to be published in a newspaper. Now, it doesn't have to be published. Like, for instance, in Los Angeles, you have the LA Times. There are smaller papers. There's the Metropolitan News and some smaller papers. I think, you know, they used to have the Daily Breeze and some other papers. Most paper, newspapers will be small enough. And then you go to the back of the section. Even the, uh, I believe, even the Marina Del Rey, the, the Argonaut is one of the papers. And I'm sure Santa Clarita has their own newspaper as well. So you can go to a smaller newspaper, and then you'll see uh, on some of those pages, you'll see Legal Notice. And on the legal notice, they'll say, hey, listen, uh, uh, Alex Grossman is publishing for three consecutive days or three weeks or whatever. Hey, that I want I want to take the name Oswaldraman. If anyone wants to object to that, you got to let me know. So basically, it's a two-part process. One, through the county recorder, recording the name, and then two, publishing. And then once that happens, then you are a DBA. Then you can operate Oswaldraman. And if somebody needs to find out who the owner is, there's a way. That's the whole point. The point is so that we can find out who the owner is, so that when my clothes are not cleaned, I can go and sue Alex. That sounds like not a good day because then I'll <laughs> refer to question one. Okay, well, that, that, that drives us to this next question, which I think is very pertinent in here. Um, it says, Every question you've asked is pertinent. Okay. Oh, well, hey, people are smart. They're, they're asking us all this stuff. They're saying, now that my business is growing, I want to make sure that I'm personally protected for me and my family. Great, great grammar there. And also have the right structure in place for later investment. Should I be an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp? What factors determine the structure I use? That's a one two part question. <laughs> you have not asked a single question yet. You've asked every question has five parts. Why don't you do question number one, A through Z? <laughs> <laughs> I like it like that. Go for it. Uh, you listen to KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM. So what you're talking about is forming a separate legal entity from yourself as an individual. Because as we said, you can open up a business. could be Alex Grossman, O's Laundry, or O's Laundromat, and you can operate your business. And that's the simplest way to do it. Uh, take a couple weeks, and you can operate. However, Alex Grossman is personally liable when Peter Bronson files a $28 million lawsuit for putting suds in his $10 million gold watch that he wants. Please don't do that. <laughs> so Alex Grossman wants to protect himself and his family. That's right. And uh, and all those quarters that he's earned from the laundromat business. So should I become an LLC before I start O's Laundry or afterward? Probably, but let's first disclose what each of those entities are that you refer to. So you're, you're really referring to is how to protect yourself so you're not personally liable. There's a number of ways you can do that, okay? One method is to form a corporation. And we're not talking about Apple Computer or IBM over here, but technically they are corporations. Now, when you form, in order to form a corporation, you can do that on your own or through a lawyer or through an online legal service. But you have to go through the Secretary of State in almost every state, and you have to, the name has to be available just like in a DBA, and you have to get the entity formed, 
and in the co case of a corporation, you have to get you get your own taxpayer identification number, which is like a social security number that's going to be associated with your company throughout time. Even if it, ten thousand years from now, that EIN will still be applicable to your company. Uh, now, you, you used another acronym, EIN. Employer identification number. Beautiful. Or taxpayer identification number. Something to identify that corporation. Okay. Now, every corporation that is formed, every corporation is a C corp. There's no such thing as forming an S corporation on day one. Hmm. Every corporation that's formed is a C corp. What's a C corp and what's an S corp? So, every, as I said, every corporation is a C corporation, which is a regular standard corporation. An S corporation is a small business election. So subchapter S. Subchapter S, a small business election. And you have to have certain criteria. <laughs> you guys in your hands. <laughs> this here. Okay. Now, the criteria is you have to have less than 75 shareholders to qualify as an S-Corp. Okay. So that's why Apple is not going to be a, an S-Corp. They have more than 75 shareholders. You have to also have unanimity among the shareholders. What does that mean? If you have eight shareholders in the company and seven want to structure it as an S-Corp and one does not, it will not be allowed to be an S-Corp. All the shareholders have to agree and consent. Okay. And now it sounds like there's a value in being an S-Corp Well, we didn't finish the process yet. Okay. If all of that happens, then you can file an S-election with the Internal Revenue Service within 75 days, I believe it is, of the court company's formation. If you don't do it, then you can't be an S corporation for that year. You're going to have to wait till the following year. Okay. Now, the differences are that in an S corporation, so if the company makes $100,000 and you have five shareholders, okay, and it has $100,000 of net profit, each shareholder will get what's called a K-1 statement that will be prepared by your accountant and sent to each of the five shareholders with $20,000. That then becomes a line item that's put on your tax return. What does that mean? The meaning that if you're in the 18% tax bracket and you have $20,000 of income as your proportionate share of ownership in that corporation, you'll be paying the 18% tax on your $20,000. The difference is in a C corporation, C corporations prior to the 2000. 817 Act that took effect on January 1st, they pay the maximum tax rate. In addition to that, not only do they pay the maximum tax rate, but after paying the minute maximum tax rate, if there's any money left in the business, you may get taxed again because you're paying taxes on the total amount of your net income. So the corporation would write a, write a check for the taxes of $100,000, and then if you got paid a dividend, you're going to be paying taxes again. Okay, my head's swimming on this on C's versus S. Don't ask an accountant it. and a lawyer a question. Absolutely. So <laughs> I, I think we got to take a break, right? So let's come back and dig in a little deeper. KHCS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Little I Leaders is the newest preschool in the Santa Clarita Valley. At Little I Leaders, our outstanding teachers lead with intellect, perspective, and heart. That means our programs provide a warm, nurturing atmosphere to meet the unique needs of each child. We believe that play is a powerful form of learning for young children. That's why our kids have every opportunity to learn through the magic and excitement of play. Parents, schedule a tour today by calling 303-0400 or online at littleileaders.org. Mission Valley Bank puts the community in community banking. They strive to be your most trusted bank. Mission Valley Bank is happy to sponsor KHTS Holiday Music. Happy Holidays! The VIP Grotto Experience at the Ivy Day Spa. Your experience begins with a clay facial mask. Then you are painted with a soothing aloe vera shea butter coconut oil body mask. In temperatured chambers, you relax and allow the moisturizing masks to work their magic. Finally, you rinse off in a rainforest shower and finish with a pH balancing mist. Treat yourself to this hydrating and refreshing experience at the Ivy Day Spa. Call to reserve your VIP Grotto Experience at 260 1244. 
It's never been so easy to have a great night out. Whether it's a date night or a girl's night out, experience Pinot's Palette in Valencia or Encino. Order your favorite drink from the bar and paint your very own masterpiece. No art experience needed. Local artists make it easy for you. So you can paint, sip, and listen to great music while creating a one-of-a-kind masterpiece. Fun, relaxing, and memorable. Pinot's Palette. To book your party, go to pinotspalette.com. That's pinotspalette.com. It's time to plan our company party. Tables, chairs, lights, and a dance floor. So much to coordinate. AV Party Rentals has everything you need for your company party. Visit their large and beautiful showroom in Newhall and discover how AV Party Rentals can create that extra accent for your company party. No worrying, no stress during setup because their delivery staff is friendly, efficient, and willing to go that extra step to make things easier. On Newhall Avenue and Carl Court, or plan your party online at avparty.com. Indulge yourself in a world of wine at the 7th Annual Sierra Polona Valley AVA Wine Festival, Saturday, April 6th, from noon to 4 p.m. benefiting the Zonta Club of SEV. Get your Chardonnay on with live music, gourmet food, handmade crafts, and the best local wines, beers, spirits, and ciders Santa Clarita has to offer at Reyes Winery. Dinus's dilettantes and wine connoisseurs alike will enjoy this festival. Sponsored by Reyes Winery, Pepsi, Anheuser-Busch, California Bank and Trust, and Mercedes-Benz of Valencia. Visit ReyesWinery.com to purchase tickets. Must be 21 or over. Santa Clarita's hometown station. Hometown station. KHTS AM 1220 and the new 98.1 FM. Welcome back. Welcome, 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 KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM, with my co-host, Alex Gross. Man. Well, hey, you're <laughs> fighting for those corporations there, Mr. Brian Johnson, so uh, let's let's get back into it. So, uh, we don't have a lot of time. You've been, you've been talking a little bit, I've noticed. What's going uh, on? I, I, I never talk, but I, I did want to reiterate something. Uh, we were talking about an S corporation and what the qualifications were, and I, there's one very mandatory, important issue that I did not discuss, and that is you have to be either a U.S. citizen or a resident alien in order to become an S corporation. So if you have 18 people that are shareholders, and if they all agree that they want to be an S corporation, and 17 of them are U.S. citizens or resident aliens becoming citizens in the United States, and one of them is not their Canadian or some other country, you cannot qualify to be an S corporation. And I think that's a very, very important issue and I want to make sure everybody was aware of that. So safety safety wise, you'd want to be a C Corp with uh, with a number of shareholders in there. But I, I understand from my past life there there's a financial reason you want to be an S Corp. It's a little cheaper and a little easier from compliance, right? Well it's it's better for the small business owner, right? When you're starting out, uh, you want to be the S corporation because you want to pay the personal tax rate, and you don't want to deal with the double taxation issue. So it's important to be the S corp. However, but if I'm going to take money, well, if you're going to, if your goal, well, first of all, as we said, because you you can't even take money from a foreigner, right? Right. So you you can do it one of two ways. You can form an LLC, okay, lim- what's called a limited liability company, which is a hybrid between typically a partnership and a corporation. And by the way, that's a new law. California was adopted in 1995. The first LLC statute was 1979. Just for your trivia buffs out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than baseball trivia, I guess. Corporate I, I, trivia. It, it's, it's a great cocktail thing. All right, so <laughs> question. So, so so going back and finishing that, so there's there's a sole proprietorship, I guess. I've heard that term. That's there's a one-person entity right. where one person owns everything. You can either do it as an individual or... Or you could do it through a DBA. That unprotected. Unprotected. No li- uh, there's no limited liability protection. If your house, I- if you lose $100,000 in a transaction, they can come and take your house and your bank account. Okay. Then there's there's a partnership. Partnership is w- uh, more than two two or more people that create a business together. They can do it through a, a document, a partnership agreement that determines how, how things should be done between those two people. But there's also no limited uh no limited liability in a regular partnership. There is in what's called an LLP, a limited liability partnership. Okay, so an LLP. And an which, LLP. And what's the difference between an LLP and an LLC? Since well, you're first into of all, TLAs, first, first of all, let's three-letter acronyms. The, first of all, let's deal with the LLP versus the partnership. So, in a partnership that requires two 
two or more people forming a business together, and they have a partnership agreement, okay, and they are both personally liable. In a limited liability partnership, there is one person that's considered to be what's called a general partner. The general partner is personally liable, but the limited partners are not personally liable. And that also would be certified through the state, just like an LLC or a corporation. Then you have an LLC, which is a limited liability company, which has no liability, okay? And you don't need to qualif the same qualifications as an S corporation to qualify. In other words, an LLC on its own will have the limited liability protection as well as um, uh, e everything else we just discussed. And the corporation is on the other end where you can have you can have a one-person corporation in California, up to a billion people in that corporation. Wow. Okay, so now what you did is just scared me as a small business owner because I'm, I'm, I'm a partner or I'm a sole proprietor, and I go, my gosh, I should be an LLC. So at any time, let's well, say I have O's Laundry under Alex Grossman, can I become an LLC at any time later? You can become one at any time later. The first thing you're going to do is go to LACorporateAttorney.com or another – uh, formation company where you can create your own business. Now you can do it at any time, but anything or the actions that occurred prior to that formation, you, you can be are held still responsible for. Responsible for, and you probably have to do an, uh, a final tax return because you're transferring business over. So probably you would want to start that actually on d on January first. So get get going and getting doing it. Okay, one last question. So I've got I've got O's laundry. I love it, but I want to protect myself against it. So in my world, it's called trademark, right? So to explain that what it is, how we get it, and what we do. And I have how long? One minute. Trademark is a is a, a, a symbol or name used to identify a product. Service mark is a name or logo used to identify a service. A trademark uh, can be done at the state level with all, within the state or can be done in a federally through the United States Patent and Trademark Harvest, which means you have to be doing business in more than one state. So if you're doing more than one state, you'd want a federal registration. Also, uh, when you get the federal registration, you, that's when you can start using the R with the circle. There's a whole bunch of stuff there. It's a whole separate show. Whole we got 30 question. seconds. How do we get it? Go to LACorporateAttorney.com or contact any, any type of uh, lawyer or online service. Fantastic. Thank you. You're listening to KHCS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Have a great week.